So this is not going to be a review of the iPhone 14 Pro Max. There's plenty of those all around. Instead, I'm going to walk you through my transition from a 6.1 inch iPhone, the iPhone 12 specifically, to the 6.7 inch iPhone 14 Pro Max and how that experience has been about two weeks into using it. And the idea behind this video, if there's anyone in a similar position, not necessarily upgrading from the iPhone 12, but from that size phone, because I went through a process. Should I go big or not? So here's my experience in case it helps. Now, this video is going to be split into two parts. The first part is the backstory, my thought process to getting the iPhone 14 Pro Max. And the second part is my experience using this phone after a week or two and my thoughts on that bigger screen. Feel free to skip to the part that interests you. The video will have selectable chapters. So here's the backstory. I went through phases with phones where I liked big phones and then smaller ones. If I go back all the way to the iPhone 4S in 2011 with a 3.5 inch display, the iPhone 5 came after it with a four inch display but it was only longer. So I skipped that. I awaited the iPhone 6 with the 4.7 inch display. And at that point there was the 6 Plus with a 5.5 inch display, but I really thought that was too big. I literally remember telling a friend of mine who got that, it's more of a tray you can serve drinks on than a phone. But then when the iPhone 7 Plus was released, it was the first phone with dual cameras. It had a telephoto lens, and that was enough for me to want to get it. So I did, and I loved it. And I got used to that size phone. Now fast forward to when the home button disappeared with the iPhone 10. The iPhone 10 had a 6.1 inch screen, but because the home button was gone, there was more screen real estate. So the size of the actual phone was actually smaller. So I went back to a smaller phone. I figured I'm getting an even bigger screen now without having to have a bigger phone. Quite literally, the iPhone 10 had a 6.1 inch screen on a body that was smaller than the iPhone 7 Plus, which had a 5.5 inch screen. And I've been on that size since then. And now fast forward to this year when the iPhone 14 and the 14 Pro were released. I was due for an upgrade from my iPhone 12. I knew I was gonna get the Pro because I felt this was the first time where the difference between Pro and non-Pro was significant, at least for me. Only the Pros got the latest A16 Bionic chip. The 14 got last year's A15, but also the Dynamic Island looked very cool. First time we have always on display, and what sealed the deal was the 48 megapixel camera. Again, it was the first time since a very long time where the sensor was upgraded from a 12 megapixel. Though more on that in a bit, because more pixels doesn't always mean better image, and most of the time, you'll be shooting 12 megapixel photos from the main sensor and not 48 megapixels, but more on that in the later part of the review. So I knew I was getting the 14 Pro. Then the big question was Pro or Pro Max? Now, I do remember when I got the iPhone 12, I was upgrading from the iPhone 11. The phone dimensions were very close, but my first reaction was, whoa, that phone is so much lighter. And they actually weighed slightly different. The iPhone 11 weighed 194 grams. The iPhone 12 weighed 164 grams. So there was 30 grams difference. Seemingly nothing, but it was significant enough to instantly feel the phone was way lighter. Now going back to the 14 Pro or 14 Pro Max, the Pro is 206 grams and the Pro Max 240 grams. Remember I'm coming from 164 grams on the 12 and the 30 gram difference between the 11 and 12 felt quite significant. So jumping to the 14 Pro was a 42 gram jump and then the 14 Pro Max, a whopping 76 gram difference. Enter existential crisis. And after much, much, much thought, I came to the conclusion, I'm gonna feel a difference in weight. Anyway, even if I go to the 14 Pro, you know, there's 42 grams. I'm definitely gonna feel that difference. Then I'm gonna get used to it. So I might as well go big. I'm gonna get used to whatever phone I get, 
whatever the weight, after a while, I'm just gonna get used to it. So, iPhone 14 Pro Max, it was. Now again, my instant reaction, whoa, it's big. Whoa, it's heavy. But whoa, it's gorgeous. And now enter part two of this video, my experience with the iPhone 14 Pro Max, and it's been great. Now I'm, I'm still using the iPhone 12 as a secondary phone, but I made it a point not to use it for a week or so, you know, to see how I'd feel about it after a week with a bigger screen. And when I did that after a week, it was a weird feeling. First of all, I hated the notch, which up to this point, it never bothered me. But when you get used to that dynamic island and go back to the notch, trust me, you feel a difference. Second thing, of course, yes, you instantly feel it's a ton lighter, but also the screen felt so small, so small to the point where I said to myself, how did I work on that phone before? So here's the conclusion I came to in terms of size and weight. Our brains are designed to adapt to stimuli or situations. It's called neural adaptation or sensory adaptation. Same way you walk into a room and instantly smell something is off, but then after some time in that room, you no longer smell that. We get olfactory fatigue is what they call it. Same thing happens with the phone. You're gonna feel a difference at first, but then your brain will adapt and you won't feel it anymore. Now this takes for granted that you won't be struggling to use the phone with the physical size of it. You know, if you have small hands, let's say, or you cannot operate it comfortably with one hand or it doesn't fit in your pocket, etc., etc. Now, another interesting thing I noticed with this experiment of mine, when you're going from a small to a big screen, up until that point, before you make that jump to the bigger screen, you haven't been bothered by that small screen. You know, it feels normal. But then the moment you go to a bigger screen, you instantly feel, oh, this is much nicer, but you don't feel the small screen was bad. You don't hate the small screen. It's just that the bigger screen is nicer. However, when you go the other way around, when you go from a big screen to a small screen, you feel the small screen is so bad, you hate the small screen. So I guess I'm trying to say you'll enjoy going bigger, Again, granted, you don't struggle with operating the phone. Does that make any sense? Anyway, that's that on size and weight. My experience with the actual phone. And again, not a review, just a few things, a few thoughts on some things here. First, with the always on display, it's nice to have, don't get me wrong, but I wouldn't miss it if it wasn't there. At least not yet. If it gets better with time, with future updates, maybe have more widgets, if we can call them that, the option to adjust brightness, maybe then it will be more useful. But for the time being, it's nice to have, if it wasn't there, not a big deal. It is though really well made. It's in color, unlike most phones that have a black and white always on display, but it's, it's limited to three widgets or even less if you choose a wider widget. So I am not a big fan. It's not as useful as I thought it would be. The Dynamic Island, on the other hand, well, I love that one more than I thought, and it's actually more useful than I thought it is. I think it's a very intelligent harmony between software and hardware, really well made and well thought of, and really cool how that island expands and retracts to show certain notifications or alerts, which are much nicer than how they used to be, but also very, very useful. And that is something I did not expect. When the AirPods connect, for example, it shows you a little AirPods icon there, which is great, especially if you have multiple devices around. It's nice to see which one the AirPods connected to. The low battery mode, for example, is no longer that obtrusive alert that you get. It's more of a subtle one in the island. Another really useful one, call timers that are always there. Now, I know this might be silly and completely useless for most of you, maybe, but I really appreciate that. In a video call, FaceTime or WhatsApp, for example, there's currently, prior to the 14 Pro, no call timer, which again might be silly, but I like that. On the 14 Pro with the island, 
you tap and you can always see how long you've been on the call. Other useful things, of course, when you're playing music, you can touch and hold to interact with a song from any screen or tap directly to go into Spotify or Amazon Music or whatever you're using. So it's more useful than I thought. And with iOS 6.1, Apple will open this to third party apps and I think it will only get better and better with time. And then the cameras are also awesome. Now, I don't have an iPhone 13 Pro at hand to give you a head to head comparison, but I'll be playing some B-roll of night photos I've captured on the iPhone 14 Pro Max while I continue speaking about the cameras. So the main sensor is the 48 megapixel, but as I said in the intro, you won't be shooting 48 megapixel photos in most cases, unless you're shooting in RAW and that would eat up your phone storage. I took a raw photo and it was around 100 megabytes. And that's fine because you really only need 48 megapixel photos when you either plan on printing them in a large size or maybe do some major cropping for some reason. So in most cases, you will be shooting in 12 megapixels on the 48 megapixel camera using pixel binning, which is essentially combining four adjacent pixels into one pixel and 48 by four is 12, hence the 12 megapixel photo. But that's fine, you'll still see better photos even if you're shooting 12 megapixels. Even more important than the megapixel count, the main sensor is also larger, about 65% larger than the previous model. And the larger the sensor, the more light can go in, the better the image, and of course, the better the low light photos are. There were also improvements on all other cameras of the iPhone as well, the 12 megapixel wide angle, which also snaps awesome macro photos, by the way, the telephoto and the front camera of the selfie camera, which is also the first iPhone selfie camera that has autofocus and actually snaps really good photos. Video also got a major boost with action mode, which stabilizes your video. Now, again, I don't have an iPhone 13 Pro at hand to show you a comparison, but here's a comparison of the iPhone 14 Pro Max in video mode with action mode enabled to the iPhone 12. And here I was actually running. So focus on the camera shake. The stabilization is really impressive on the 14 Pro Max. It feels like shooting using a gimbal. And of course there's cropping going on, it's software enhanced stabilization. And that's why when you click on action mode, it defaults to the wide angle camera, although you can still shoot on the telephoto or the main sensor. But the reason it defaults to the wide angle camera is to give the camera some buffer space. But nonetheless, the results are impressive. So do I regret going big? Absolutely not. I cannot imagine how I worked on a smaller phone before. Moral of my story, go big or go home, at least for me. Thanks for watching, and if you liked the video, please hit the like button and consider subscribing to my channel as this encourages me to continue producing content. Until next time, cheers.